In this talk, Mika will share the results of a study into the systemic design practices of five international innovation labs in the context of the public and social sector. So, over to Mika. All right, welcome everyone. Um, it's great to have this session in this space today because this is, uh, this is my home, this is where I, where I teach. Um, so I work at the Faculty of Transdisciplinary Innovation and uh, today you are in the studio of the Bachelor of Creative and Intelligence and Innovation students. Um, so we call that degree the BCII because it's such a long word. Um, and uh, this degree was established four years ago. Um, because uh, there were a couple of really bright people who realized that what we were doing in universities was not going to prepare students for, um, for the future. Uh, because regardless of the profession that students are going to be in, uh, they're going to have to deal with a lot of complexity and are going to have to deal with, with a very quickly changing world. So we all know that you know, the world's changing, we're hyper-connected, there's lots of technology development. Um, some people say the world's changing so fast that it's almost becoming impossible to become an expert in anything and that everyone will always be a newbie. So, uh, you know, if everyone always will be a newbie, what do you teach to students? Um, so this degree was set up uh, as a double degree. So it's a degree that students do on top of 25 other degrees at UTS. <coughs> a wide range of different degrees, ranging from business and law to design, fashion, architecture, science, uh, engineering and IT. And we bring them together to think about things like, you know, the, the, the skills that we need to address, uh, to be able to have to, to be able to adapt. We often talk about adaptation. Uh, so those include, um, you know, social skills, being able to collaborate. Um, imagination is very important. It's not just about analytics. It's really about, you know, coming up with new solutions as well. Um, that's why we call it creative intelligence. Uh, but we also do a lot of systems thinking and complexity. So my background is in human-centered design. I have a degree in design from Delft University in the Netherlands and a PhD in human-centered design as well from the Netherlands. And I, I came to Sydney uh, five years ago because um, I was really interested in the application of design in the social domain. Um, I first learned about systems thinking only two and a half years ago, so I am actually quite a newbie when it comes to <coughs> systems thinking, um, at the conference that Jax just mentioned, so related systems thinking and design. Uh, interesting enough, both Tim and I, I think we were at the conference and we both have a, a paper in one of their um, special issue journals. Um, and um, the interesting thing is that at the same time I learned a lot about systems thinking within my teaching. So it came to me from two ways and I found it super, super useful in my work. Um, so today I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about systems thinking and systemic design and how that applies to my research. Uh, but what I'm going to do first is I'm going to give uh, a brief introduction into systems thinking and I'm going to start at a very, very basic level because uh, I'm just, you know, uh, want to start at, at you know, where, where um, yeah, I want to start with the basics for people to be able to understand what we're really talking about. Um, so I'll do that first, and then I'll um, share some of my research in public and social innovation. So, what is a system? First, need, when we talk about systems thinking, you first need to talk about what a system is. So a system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts. So systems are, uh, you know, our bodies are systems. It cannot be divided into in independent parts. We cannot just take out organs. We, we would no, no longer be uh, a human being if we did that. Um, uh, groups of people are systems. We call it social systems. Uh, organizations are systems. Uh, we can often think about technological systems, computer systems. Um, so I, I find it very hard to think of anything that's not a system or, or at least part of a system. Um, the behavior of each element in a system has an effect on the whole, and the behavior of the elements and their effects on the whole are in, in, interdependent. So uh, the behavior of our organs uh, has an influence on how we behave as a human being. Um, so you know, as a human being, we have all these qualities that none of, these, none of our organs have. So we are able to, um, to write, to dance, to teach, uh, and none of our organs can do that, but they all contribute to that. They all contribute to those, those, those functions, but they do it in an interrelated way. So the way our heart functions is related to how our lungs function, is related to how our kidneys function, is related to how our brains function. Um, 
A system is not the sum of the behavior of its part, it's the product of their interactions. So there's re this really great talk by uh, Akov, uh, if Russ Akov had given a TED talk. <laughs> um, by the way, um, there's a, a lot of um, references in this um, uh, presentation to uh, material that I think is very interesting and uh, I put all my slides on my website for you to download so you don't have to take pictures of the slides. Um, and this one is on there as well. Um, and he's uh, giving this example of um, if you, you know, if you take the 10 best cars in the world and you take out the best parts of each of those cars, you put them together, it's not necessarily going to be a good car. Or if you think of a sports team, you know, you, you take the best players from the 10 best teams, you put them together, there's no guarantee that that team is going to be a good team. Because what's important is that uh, the, the, the sum the, the system is the product of the interaction of those parts. So interactions are very key to systems. Now, systems thinking is basically about this. Seeing the bigger picture and connecting the dots. That's usually how I explain it. Um, in theoretical terms, that's called um, uh, analysis and uh, synthesis. Um, so Akov, again, he explains this in his, uh, in his book. He says, well, systems thinking is basically the combination of analysis and synthesis, where analysis is based on uh, reductionism and determinism, so difficult terms, but reductionism basically means that you, if there's a complex problem, you just break it up into smaller pieces, um, you try to improve each of those pieces, and then um, you hope that you know, when you melt them together, weld them together, that it's going to uh, get to a better solution. Um, while synthesis is about what uh, Akov calls expansionism, um, so I'm just going to explain that through an example. So if we take the system of a university and we would approach uh, improving that university through an analytic lens, what we would do is we would reduce the university to its parts. So the parts of the university are the faculties, they are at the different degrees, they are um, the different academics that work there and the students that, that study there. Uh, we would try to um, you know, make sure that those academics are at their best, that the students are at their best, uh, and we look at how those uh, uh, different parts are then related to each other, and that creates kind of a, a better university. Now, if we would apply systems thinking, what we would do is, um, we would not start looking inward, we would start with looking outward. So we look at, you know, what's the system that the university is part of in the first place, um, and what's the relation of that system to the bigger system? Um, so, a uh, university is part of the educational system, and the educational system has a uh, place in society. What's, what's the role of, of the educational system in society? Well, we could think about, you know, we, as, as educational system, uh, we contribute to the body of knowledge, but we also uh, help, um, uh, uh, we teach people how to um, get, a, get a job in professional professional worlds. Um, or how we prepare students for uh, also for life skills, so it's not just about jobs. Uh, so our, if one, once we start thinking about those terms, we can then start looking at well, what then what's the role of university within that educational system? We could look at the you know relationship between university and high schools, but nowadays we're also talking about the ro role of universities in relation to what we call lifelong learning. Um, and only then would we start looking at you know what we, do we need to do as a university to be able to achieve those goals. So we would never have been able to develop the BCII if we would only have looked inwards. You know, we looked at out what's happening out there in the world and then we were able to develop uh, the degree. So analysis is basically about how things work. Synthesis about, is about why things operate as they do. And system thinking combines the two. So it doesn't say that analysis is bad. It just says, you know, just analysis is not enough. Um, so it's called a holistic and a synthetic approach. So holistic, you know, look at the bigger picture, and synthetic, look at how everything, how everything is connected to each other. So um, relationships are very key to systems thinking, looking at relationships. Um, and I would like to show that through um, a little bit of an experiment. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is to all stand up. Please all stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and turn, turn to someone you haven't met yet, or maybe you don't know that well. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm Rachel. Can you just feel me here? That's what we call emergence. Talk about 
that later. And what were you t what were you talking about? Someone wants to say what they were talking about? Uh, why we're here? <laughs> why we're here? Yeah. Anything else? What we do? What you do? Yeah. What we want to do? <laughs> what you want to do? Yeah. Whether it's possible. <coughs> what? Whether it's possible. Whether it's possible. Interesting. So uh, what I just did was I kind of changed the nature of this event. So when we come to an event like this, um, we assume that we're going to learn something from, in this case, two experts. And we will come here and kind of transfer all our knowledge to you. <laughs> um, so this is kind of a technical view of what um, learning is about. Uh, but actually we are a system together and if we look at the relationships between each other you see that something really interesting happens. Um, so I actually didn't give you any instructions. I know they were on the slides but um, it was very interesting that straight away everyone started interacting which is very great. Um, so when you look at you know a social system like that in that way you don't uh, assume that you know the, the expertise just sits with the people who are talking you get much more interesting dynamics so um, relationships are really key to systems if we want to do systems thinking we really need to understand the nature of the relationships within that system um, I'm particularly interested in social systems uh, like that but that, you know it's um, Tim's going to talk about social <laughs> technical systems later um, and relationships are key in any kind of system. So there's many different types of uh, systems, social systems, technical systems, ecosystems, animate systems, social technical <laughs> systems. Each of those systems have slightly different behaviors. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, I don't have time for that today, but it's, it's important to be aware that you know, di uh, different systems have a different nature and might behave in a different way. Um, there are different ways of thinking about systems. Um, I just started listing all the theories I know of. Um, system dynamics, system layers, complex adaptive systems, complexity theory, organizational systems, actor network theory, ecological systems theory, evolutionary theory, game theory, social systems theory, theory U, the intriguing model. Um, so there are lots and lots of different theories out there. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't think there's, I think it will be very hard to find a person who understands all of those different theories. Um, what's worked for me is to kind of look at the theories that kind of resonate with what I'm doing, but also look at the theories that people are talking about in my field. So in my field of social innovation, a lot of people are talking about leverage points, for example. So I started reading a bit into system dynamics, uh, because that's where that term comes from. So when you learn something, want to learn something about systems theories, it'd be good to you know to get a sense of the different theories that are out there. But I wouldn't recommend to read everything there is. First of all, it's very theoretical. A lot of it work is, is very theoretical and, and or or, uh, or philosophical. So if you're looking for practical tools, that's quite difficult to find. And also, there's just you know there's just a lot of it. It's also very rich, so it's a great great source. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about. Um, some elements that I think are relevant in terms of looking at how systems uh, behave. Um, one particularly relevant uh, theory is the theory of complex adaptive systems that a lot of people talk about. So the flock of birds is, is, is uh, an example that is uh, often used. There are a couple of characteristics of complex adaptive systems. Um, Self-organization, emergence and non-linearity. So the idea of complex adaptive systems is that they exist of um, uh, large groups of, uh, of smaller parts, and those parts, they interact with each other on a local level, we call that. Um, but what's interesting is that while these parts um, um, interact with each other on a local level, they uh, collectively produce these overarching patterns that are not controlled or guided by any one of those parts or agents, as they call it in complex adaptive systems. Um, so the birds, they're all interacting with each other, but they produce, collectively, they produce these amazing shapes. Um, but there's no bird who's kind of in control of that whole system. Um, and those, you know, those emerging patterns, that's what we refer to as emergence, that's also why uh, complex systems are unpredictable. We can't really predict what's going to happen. Um, and they have a, a non-linearity, non-linear character. So there's not a linear relationship between cause and effect. And it's very difficult to say, well, if I'm going to, this, going to do this to a system, 
to a complex system, then that is going to happen. Um, an interesting example is the COBRA effect that you might have heard of. So the COBRA effect is this example that's often used. Um, it's the story about uh, the time uh, of the British Empire when the British government uh, was in uh, India and they noticed there were a lot of cobras in Delhi. Um, and the story goes that they wanted to get rid of those cobras, so what they did was they put in place a reward program so people could get uh, a reward for each cobra that they would catch and kill. Um, people very quickly found out it was very lucrative uh, and they started breeding cobras. cobras. <laughs> um, then the government found out that people were actually breeding cobras, so they stopped the program and the farms released all the cobras. So the, so the problem was even worse. So that's an example of very kind of new emergent behavior that was not anticipated. Uh, it also includes feedback loops, which is another aspect of systems thinking, um, which makes it very difficult to address uh, complex problems. Another interesting element is what we can see of, uh, of systems. Um, an often used model is the iceberg model. Um, so the events are the things that are happening that we can actually see. Below that we have patterns of behavior, then we have our structures, and underlying we have our mental models. Um, so we could, for example, think about um, the mass shootings that are happening in the US. So there might be one mass shooting happening, but then we look at you know, kind of start comparing different events, we can see that there's a pattern. So, you know, they happen uh, within particular time frames at certain types of events, certain, certain types of locations. Uh, we can then start thinking about, you know, what are the structures underlying those patterns that might influence those patterns? So they could be, in this case, for example, legal structures such as gun laws, but they also could also all kind of, could be all kinds of uh, economic reasons such as um, the influence of the weapon industry. But below that, when we get to the deepest level, we get to the values and the beliefs and the assumptions that we have about this system that shapes, shapes this system. And then we get to think about, well, how do people feel about uh, weapons in relation to protection, for example, what their rights are as the public to protect themselves. Um, when you get to this deeper level, these deeper, deeper levels, they're more difficult to observe, but they're also much more difficult to influence or to change. Now this is what um, uh, Donella Meadows calls increasing leverage. So uh, the deeper you go, if you can actually change those things, you can really leverage, like you can get really, really big change. Um, but it's also much harder and it's much slower. Um, so Donella Meadows, she wrote a really great essay uh, about it, which I highly recommend. Uh, Don Donella Meadows is from the system dynamics uh, the, uh, uh, movement. Um, and she introduced this, um, uh, these levels of um, uh, ways to uh, intervene in, um, in, in, in uh, leverage points to intervene in the systems. It's called, it's an essay. <coughs> uh, she basically describes 12 different levels at which we can intervene in systems. And at the bottom of that, um, we have those deeper values. In her case, she talks about paradigms and how we can actually change paradigms. So how might we then intervene in systems? Um, uh, the best way to talk about it is the Conefi framework by David Snowden. I'm not going to go through all of it, you might be familiar with it. But David Snowden describes different types of systems and what's particularly interesting is the difference between a complicated system and a complex system. <coughs> so a complicated system being a system that you can actually, um, you can uh, break apart into smaller pieces and you can actually weld them together to get to a bigger understanding of that, of that system. Um, because there is a relationship between cause and effect that, that experts can actually um, uh, identify. Um, and what Snowden says is in a complicated system, what you do is you can use expertise to kind of build that system. He uses the example of an, of an aeroplane where you can, you know, with aerospace engineers, if you have the right expertise, you can actually get uh, to build a plane and you can predict that it's going to fly. But in a complex system, that's impossible. Uh, what Snowden says is in a, in a complex system you can never know what the relationship is between cause and effect. All you can do is what he calls probe, sense and response. So basically what he's saying is that if there's a complex system, you don't know what the relationship is between cause and effect. You can't predict how it's going to uh, behave. But we can do small things, that's what he calls probing, uh, and then look at what the impact of that smaller thing is. If we like that, we can amplify it, and if we don't like it, we take it away. 
So addressing, if we want to intervene in system, he's basically saying, well, we have to do stuff. You know, we can't just analyze and use expertise. We actually have to do stuff to find out how to move it forward. Um, systems thinking tools and methods, very briefly. There are a lot of systems thinking tools and methods out there, but it's mostly mapping and modeling. Um, so systems thinkers love use maps, which is great. It's a great overview of overviews of you know, how the different parts are related to each other. Um, and modeling is, the, you know, there's a lot of computer modeling done, particularly uh, more in the sphere of the complex, or sorry, of the complicated problems. Uh, but also complex adaptive systems, um, uh, the theorists, uh, uh, there are a lot of them who use computer models uh, with agents to try to predict how that system is going to behave. Uh, these are uh, Berger Sevatson and uh, Linda Blasphere from the uh, Oslo School of Architecture and Design, who I visited uh, earlier this year for a month. Um, they have a systems-oriented design program, which is really great, but they also have a really great website. Uh, which is a great resource if you're looking for tools uh, of syst systems thinking and systemic design particularly, uh, that's a very good resource that I would recommend. So uh, there's also been a lot of critique of systems thinking. It has been criticized for focusing only on analyzing and modeling systems and lacking practical approaches to innovate on problems within those systems. Um, so almost all of those theories, except probably for, uh, for Donella Meadows work on the, um, leverage points and uh, Stoner's work on how you need to, to, to probe. Um, the theories, they describe the behavior of systems, uh, they attempt to predict the behavior of systems, but they're not telling us what we should do with complex problems that you know, sit in those systems. So systems change is actually not that easy. So this is where um, design comes in. Systemic design is where systems thinking and design come together. Because design is one of those practical that can help us come up with um, uh, interventions um, or solutions uh, within those systems. We can look at design in terms of the design of systems, design for systems, and design within systems. So a lot of people are talking about systems design, not systemic design. Systems design is when we talk about designing of systems. Uh, we can only design systems that don't have any human beings in it, because as soon as there is a human being within the system, it becomes un unpredictable. Um, so um, uh, systems designers are usually uh, engineers. So I'd like to start with an, uh, with an example from the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, TAXI. Um, some people from TAXI with us uh, today. Um, and they gave me the opportunity to study one of their projects uh, called Rethinking Restoration. So Taxi partnered with an organization called the Sydney Meyer Fund um, because the Sydney Meyer Fund was interested in improving the services of uh, foster care. And what they were asking initially was um, to help them to uh, basically bring more children back home to their birth families from, uh, from foster care. So that's what they call restoration. Um, and Taxi then thought, well, you know, uh, we can do that, but we can't do this without the the, the organizations that are already in the system. So they partnered then with uh, New South Wales uh, Family and Community Services, um, which is a, a government organization, to uh, kind of collectively look at this, product, uh, at this problem. So this is what we call public and social innovation, uh, because it involves public sector organizations, uh, social sector organizations, and they're looking at a complex societal problem, and they're trying to innovate on that problem. They're trying to create something new. So my question in this study was, what is it that design brings to public and social innovation, particularly if we're looking at complex societal problems? Uh, and I looked at one particular element of design. Um, case Source calls this a core practice of design, which is problem framing. So uh, designers have a particular way of looking at problems and reframing problems. Uh, and Schoen defies this, this as follows. He says, in order to convert a problematic situation to a problem, a practitioner needs to do a certain kind of work. Problem setting is a process in which interactively we name the things to which we will attend and frame the context in which we will attend to them. Um, so I started looking at design and framing in public and social innovation labs. So innovation labs, they are agencies or uh, departments of organizations uh, who have uh, specialized skills in innovation. Um, and they often work with, um, within or alongside, alongside public and social sector organizations. 
Um, I did five case studies. I visited um, the actual labs. I interviewed the people around one particular case study, but I also interviewed uh, the partnering organizations uh, and I studied all the design materials that they created, so all the drawings that they made and the, and the, and the reports that they um, wrote. There were five case studies. Uh, a time quality dilemma for primary school teachers by MindLab, who no longer exist, but they were in Denmark. Uh, young Lab, which, which was about how to live well as a young person in Nijmegen, in the Netherlands, by Kennis Lands. Uh, Kudos, really interesting case study about social isolation of people with a cognitive disability, by Ingrid Forward in Vancouver. Uh, then I studied Rethinking Restoration. Um, and a case, I did a case study with op Open Government, uh, um, which was about Open Government with uh, the Alberta co in, uh, in Canada as well. So uh, today I'm just going to talk about what I found that is related to uh, systems thinking, systemic design principles, uh, because I think it's most relevant. Um, so there are a couple of principles that I found um, that I'm going to um, illustrate with some examples. Opening up, uh, using a portfolio of frames and solutions, strengthening relationships, and then with some other principles as well. So opening up. So what was interesting, you know, initially I talked about um, expansionism, that systems thinking is about expanding, and that's actually what all those agencies did. Um, so uh, the CEO from Taxi said, well, we started off with a brief, and then from there we really started, I guess, pounding the pavement and seeking to really test, unpack all of the assumptions that were sitting behind the framing questions. And I think what we learned very, very quickly was some fundamental things that opened up the brief to a whole new level. So they start with a small problem, but they quickly open that up and actually becomes a bit of a bigger problem. Um, so what that looked like in taxi is, well, they started with the questions, how do we enable more children to safely return home to their families, stay home and thrive? Uh, but they quickly realized that that's not always the best option for a child, unfortunately. It's not always the best option to uh, return to their, um, to their families. Um, so they opened it up, they said, well, how might we better enable children and families engaging with the child protection system to live safely and thrive? Mm -hmm. So really looking at this bigger picture of, of um, child protection. Uh, and eventually one of the things that they developed was a really interesting uh, co-parenting model, which was based around the idea of how might foster care build and maintain, maintain parental capability and keep families together. So how uh, the idea is that you know, foster, foster families work with the birth families uh, and collectively they look after the child and they also learn from each other. Um, so you can see how they kind of opened up and then kind of zoomed in into um, uh, one of the, uh, a different way of looking at the problem. So that's what we call framing. Also we saw that all those different case studies I had what I am now calling a portfolio of different solutions and um, uh, sometimes some prefer to call it interventions or prototypes. Um, and uh, so that's, that's related to the idea of evolutionary theory in systems thinking, where if you have a complex system, you can't actually solve a complex system, uh, but you can do multiple things to start that system moving. So if you know, Snowden talks about probe sensor response, response you can actually uh, use multiple probes. Um, and Taxi specifically, they said, well, we do things on a system level and what they call a prototype level. They call that two-track thinking. So a system, think, a system level might think about things like, you know, how can we change the culture or the mindsets? Uh, but those are going to take a long, long time. Uh, and at the same time, we'd want to do something now as well. So they also create prototypes such as that co-parenting model that they can immediately uh, implement. Um, a third principle, and I find that particularly interesting uh, from a human-centered point of view, as uh, my background is human-centered design, is about the strengthening of relationships. So already in a taxi case study, the relationship between the foster family and the, um, the birth family was something that was changed through this uh, program, which I think is very interesting. Uh, but there's another interesting case study, that's this one, the time quality dilemma for teachers. So uh, here I'm interviewing two ladies from the municipality of Odense in Denmark. Uh, and this case study was about the following. So um, primary school teachers, they will, were dealing with an educational reform that was um, implemented by uh, the ministry. And the result of that reform was that teachers got less time to prepare their lessons, but they still had to deliver the same quality lessons. 
So obviously the teachers were not very happy at all. Um, they became very passive. Some of them threatened to, to resign, and um, the municipality really wanted to do, wanted to help um, the teachers within their municipality to deal with this uh, this problem. Um, and so they partnered up with MindLab uh, and asked them, "Well, what can we do?" Um, so MindLab, what MindLab does, this team of the, this particular team of MindLab did was they used what they call provocative prototypes. Um, so it's a very designerly approach, so you don't just start, you know, analyzing the problem, uh, but straight away they start thinking about what, what, what could we possibly do to help uh, to do address this problem. Let's just build prototypes of the ideas we have. We introduce them and, and then we kind of test them and then see we, what comes back. So a bit like probing. Um, so they, uh, one of their first prototypes was a lesson box, which is based on the idea of um, a Hello Fresh meal kit, where you have your box with ingredients and a recipe, but in this case you have a box with lesson ingredients and a recipe for a lesson. Um, and then they thought, well, let's kind of co-design this box with the teachers, um, because we don't know what needs to be in this box. So they had this session, creative session with teachers, they said, well, we have this box, what do you think should be in the box? And the teachers started working with this box. But after a while, the teachers said, well, we don't, we don't really want to continue. We, we don't really like the box. And uh, my dad was like, well, why, why don't you like the box? Oh, we get boxes like this all the time, and we're not using them. They're just piling up in the corner of the room. So my dad was like, OK, you know, it's just an experiment. So we just try other prototypes, try lots and lots and lots of different prototypes. And eventually, um, they found one that they really loved, which is speech sharing event, something totally different. So a speech sharing event is an event where um, teachers come together around a particular topic. So for example, marking or physical exercise. Um, it's organized by municipality or school. So teachers from different schools come together, they speed date, they meet each other, and they start sharing ideas about their lessons. So then they start basically learning from each other. Now the teachers just love this. Um, and they started rolling this out all across uh, Denmark. Um, so that's very interesting. I find it very interesting. Like, why this, did they love this, and why did they not love, you know, the initial uh, uh, box? And we can uh, uh, explain that through um, uh, through systems thinking, uh, also through human-centered design. But I'll particularly focus on systems thinking. So. <coughs> um, in design, we often talk about service design. So service design is kind of that intangible aspect where um, there's an interaction between a service provider and what we call a, a service uh, consumer uh, at an interface. So there could be a doctor talking to a patient or uh, someone in a call center talking to a customer on the phone or a teacher teaching a student. Um, and uh, services are uh, often thought of like this, so there's an, an interface where this interaction happens. You never know completely what's going to happen there, so it's kind of fluid. Um, the service is, is co-produced there, it's the word that's been used, so the service doesn't exist if there's no interaction. It comes into existence one, once that interaction is there. And then there's an infrastructure that su supports these service providers in delivering the services. So an infrastructure is like the physical infrastructure, can be the environment, can be the technology, but also the organizational in infrastructure, and whatever is given to that service provider to be able to do their job. Um, so for a teacher, that could be you know, their, uh, the, the, the classes, the, the rooms in which they teach, the technology they use, the, uh, the kind of educational models that they use, those kind of things. Um, very often we think of these things in a linear way, uh, and for example, when you th think about someone working in a call center, they actually get scripts which prescribe how they have to, have, have to, how they have to behave. Um, so with the lesson box, that actually follows that linear pattern. So there's a lesson box, you give it to the teachers, and it allows those teachers to do their lesson. Um, what they did though with this, this speech sharing event is they created something totally different. Because they started creating, again, interactions, interrelationships between the teachers. Um, and that to me, it makes a lot more sense that these teachers um, like that a lot more because I often compare it to um, kind of uh, having a, a pride in your practice. So if you think about your own, your own practice, your own work, you're probably proud of what you've achieved. Um, if someone comes in and just gives you some tips, it's unlikely that you will take it on. But if you, you know, if you meet with your peers, you actually, you know, it's very nice to learn from each other. So you would never give a HelloFresh meal kit to a chef. Um, so if you look at it in that way, you know, it makes sense that you know, teachers don't want their lesson box. 
So that's what I call a social infrastructure. Uh, and, that's, and that's again, it's about the relationships within the system. In the system, once you start focusing on relationships, you get totally different ideas. Um, so these are some of the systemic design principles I found. Um, uh, I'm still looking at that uh, that aspect of my data. Uh, they're also trying to do a lot about culture and mindset change, but it's really difficult. Um, what I find very interesting is that systems thinking is often implicitly or intuitively applied. So none of these designers said they, they were actually doing systems thinking. Maybe they do, you know, they were inspired by certain techniques but, or certain theories. Uh, but it was not mentioned a lot, so I find that quite interesting. And I think if we, you know, understand those principles better, then we can actually, you know, more, learn more from each other and actually do something with it. Um, so I'm going to wrap up, wrap up very briefly about design within systems. Um, I recently read this, this quote, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic, which I think is such a great quote. Because uh, we often think of, you know, it's so easy, you know, when we're designing for the system there, and as academics, we're even more distant, like we're just doing our work for the, design, for the practitioners there, we're then doing something with the system there. But we're actually, we're all part of systems as well. We're part of systems, we have a responsibility. Um, to act in this in, in the system in in, 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 a, in, in a positive way, uh, and I think it's very important to be, be aware of that, not to distance ourselves from the system where we want to innovate for, but to actually engage with it. And I actually think that if I think about you know the case studies that are really really successful, they're usually case studies where uh, the innovators are very very engaged with the system and uh, really really interacting with the system and really taking their responsibility. Um, this is also a great uh, paper that I recommend. Uh, so I'd like to leave it at that. Oh, these are all the references. Again, these are in my slides. Um, this is my website. Uh, and you can uh, download the slides there if you're interested. Uh, thank you very much. I think we do questions later, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah.